Welcome to the Tetraki Business Revolution podcast. My name is Rob Yates, and together with my co-founder, Mark Hopkins, we're going to be coming to you at least twice a week with groundbreaking business revolutionary podcasts. In these podcasts, we're going to be bringing to you true business revolutionaries. That's people who've done it differently, done it their way, had success, achieved more than the rest, and are willing to share with you exactly how they went about doing it. As well as that, Mark Hopkins, my co-founder, and I will be bringing you podcasts where we give you information about what it is we're doing to grow a business from one country across five continents in just four years. In this episode, we are joined by Mr. Phil Lewis, who moved cities with his families with less than $10 in his pocket and has gone on to create two phenomenal businesses. He shares practical insights in terms of how to make those life-changing decisions, how to identify and grow incredibly fulfilling customer relationships, how being a great human pays back, how to manage debtors, So enjoy this episode. You are going to take away so many insights, practical tips that you can implement into your business and your life today. This podcast is brought to you by the Tetricky Business Revolutionary Club. Our free to join, no catches, no commitments, no credit card membership program that brings to you twice a month, loads of free content, interviews, early releases of podcasts, strategies, actionable content that you can put into place for yourself, your business, or possibly your team to ensure that when your future arrives, it's one that you've designed and that you are truly happy with. To go and join the Revolutionary Club, it's free of charge. Go and look in the notes below in the description, find the link, click on it, or follow revolutionaryclub.tetricky.com and join today. Now, without further ado, let's step forwards into this session's amazing podcast. Welcome to this edition of the Business Podcast. Um, the Business Revolutionary Podcast is, is something where we are engaging with exceptional people. We're engaging with people who we have either come across directly or have heard of or have read books of who have literally made us sit up and stop. And that, for me, is what a revolutionary does. They make you sit up and stop. And today, we have somebody who, who made me stop in the middle of my backswing on the golf course. Uh, it might have been the, the, the wager that we're having on that particular hole that he didn't want to lose his money. But it's when you, when you have a conversation with somebody and they make you stop mid-swing, then you know you want to spend more time chatting to, to this individual. So I am so thrilled to introduce to you Phil Lewis. Um, good afternoon, sir. Um, Phil is... Um, it's, I find it a bit of a disservice to call him a, a businessman, even though that is, is what he does, because he is not limited by business. He's, his thought process, the way he does stuff, is not limited by how most of us define business. He is an individual who is constantly looking to shape the future and do it in a way that benefits as many people as possible. And Phil also has a fantastic story, a story that uh, if it doesn't inspire you, then you need to probably go to the doctor because you might be flatlining at the moment. Um, And it's a story that inspires me because um, with the right drive vision, you can go from where Phil started to where he is now. um, And... We're in, we, we have a lot of emails from people of this rag to riches story. We have a lot of follow me, copy what I do, and you can achieve what I did in two months, which for me is a load of crap and it doesn't exist. You have to work blooming hard. And Phil is a very successful individual through 
endeavor and brains. So before we, we get onto the conversation, to remind you that the Business Revolution podcast is brought to you by the Business Revolutionary Club, which is Tetrakey's flagship product. It is our free business coaching where every 14 days you get incredible content and insight which will change your business and your life. And for further information, just go to the description below in the podcast and you can get, you can sign up and join this incredible community. So, Phil, let's um, recap. We've, we met through a mutual friend and um, the mutual friend got us onto the golf course where we both ended up hacking a little bit. Uh, but that's the whole beauty of golf, eh, Phil? It's, where it's a kind of game where you actually spend money to have the most amount of shots so you can have um, the most amount of compensation. It's something that, that we did very, very well that day. So um, I'm very chuffed to, to Keegan Pierce for introducing us. So Phil... Um, you've got two incredible businesses. Uh, so what we're going to do, we'll start at the end and work backwards. So um, let's just see and let everyone know straight away into a normal day of Phil Lewis. What's a normal day look like for you? Normal day of Phil Lewis. Wow. Sometimes I have to think about that myself. But <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for a wonderful introduction. I was trying to guess who that guy actually was at one stage. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so look, a normal day, getting up in the morning, going to gym, taking the kids to school, enjoy uh, spending time with the girls and just enjoy uh, seeing how they grow and develop in terms of their lives. Um, and then, uh, yeah, heading the office, just checking sort of what's happening for the day. You know, are all the customers okay? Um, you didn't really mention the sort of businesses I did, so... If I say that I follow up on deliveries in the morning, it's going to confuse me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I've, I've got a trucking industry, a, a trucking business, which is predominantly what we focus on on a, on a daily basis. Um, we have uh, depots and facilities around the country. Um, and we, we predominantly run all your teas and, and so forth into Johannesburg. So while it's nice and cold now, they can at least uh, have a hot beverage. Um, <laughs> you being a pom, it should make a big difference how you like your tea. <laughs> exactly. It's got to be stirred um, clockwise only. Anybody who stirs tea anti-clockwise is just not doing it properly. Yeah. So, and I mean, obviously an average day is just dealing with customer queries, uh, basically making sure drivers are happy, employees are happy making sure everybody's doing what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, a lot of the time, as long as it's not firefighting, it's, it's a pretty good day, you know? And um, yeah. That's cool. And I love how, again, how you start your day as well. Cause obviously you and I have, have bumped into each other numerous times at the gym and dropping off kids and stuff. And um, I love how the straight away you're talking about integrating all aspects of your life. So even though you run, two very successful businesses and um, your, your time is a commodity for you. You straight away talking about watching your kids grow and, and not losing sight of that. Yeah, I think, Mark, I think any successful business is, uh, needs to have a balance. And, um, you know, in terms of that balance and what your objectives are and your long-term and short-term goals, um, all is the basis of in terms of what your success can be and what you want it to be. Um, it's pretty pointless working nine to five, not seeing your kids, not seeing your wife and, uh, and just saying, well, it's work, work, work. Where's the balance? You know, at the end of the day, it's going to break, you know, either your kids at home aren't going to know who you are or your, or your wife is uh, not going to know who you are either. So, you know, in terms of success, it's, it's all about balance and uh, making sure you doing things for the right reason and also taking that time out and, uh, you know, enjoying life a little bit, um, you know, and you don't have to necessarily be a successful person to just have quality of life and uh, manage, manage your, your day to days as a normal thing. I mean, I know, listen, you generally talk to business owners, etc., but you know, there's people out there that are, you know, people that work day-to-day -day lives and they also want to be successful. And obviously they feed off this type of thing to see, well, what makes him different? I mean, 
if you ask most of our people, I mean, look, I'm in short sleeves today, but <laughs> they'll go, geez, Phil has his own business, but he, does he really do any work? Because, you know, he's got an office at home. Like, does, does it really actually, is it real? <laughs> so, you know, it's all a mindset. But, I mean, that's the life you choose and, and that's the balance you choose, you know, to be able to have that freedom and that flexibility. And, and one of the reasons what was my kids were my biggest drive. Um, you know, I, I wanted to spend time with them. I wanted to go and see them play sports and I wanted to be involved in their lives. I didn't want them growing up thinking, I oh, know my dad worked really hard, but you know, we didn't really see him much. And, and every time you went to an event, they weren't there. So, you know, that, that became a big drive and, and you structure your goals around that to, to achieve that as well. And I mean, you know, in saying that, uh, Michelle, my partner, who's fantastic in the business and such a pillar of strength, um, I don't think any person could do it without them by your side either. So, you know, there's a lot of elements in terms of a successful business and it's what you choose to have them as, as to be successful. Jeesh, and, and just in what you said there, there's, you and I could probably have a 10-hour conversation just on, on what you've talked about. But again, the elements that, and again, it's something that's such a powerful lesson for people to recognize is, when you're looking at building success, and let's, let's, we can put whatever you want to put at the end of that sentence, successful business, successful life, whatever it is, um, it is, it's the environment that you're creating drives the success. It's not about just also, almost just the business. It's the it's a support structure you put in place. And you talked a lot there about balance, and I know uh, we all go through journeys. Um, I, is, was there, can you remember a time when, when you struggled to get that balance right and what was the cause of that struggle and what kind of changes did you make to, to bring balance back into your life? Um, yeah, there was definitely a time in Joburg. Uh, you know, I, I've been involved in transport for a very long time. I started working for DHL when I was fresh out of school and sort of worked my way up the, the different channels. But um, you know, and as you're working up and you and you sort of try new things and, you know, I, I do believe every successful person, there's probably three failures behind them. And I mean, mm. if you read the books of Richard Branson and the likes of, you know, their first idea was never their greatest idea, um, you know, and I, I think that builds character in terms of making things better. Um, you know, when I was in Joburg, I was working from six till nine o'clock at night, you know, and then when I wasn't uh, working, I'd sort of be out with clients, having drinks, coming home, you know, uh, not in a great state. So you, you, you weren't really appreciated at home and you were coming home late and, you know, you need to turn that switch and make, make the difference and say, right, you know, if I'm going to make this work on both sides, what I need to do. And, and that was one of the reasons we moved to Durban. You know, I just sort of realized I'd come to a cul-de-sac in my life, said, you know, if this is going to be it, there's some sacrifices to be made and, and moved on and, and basically gave up everything that I, I had in Joburg and took the whole family to Durban. And we, we started off fresh and uh, we, uh, I started this business with the last 300 Rand I had in my bank account. Um, went to shelf company and bought the, the CC. I borrowed 25 grand from a friend of mine in Joburg, who, uh, which basically paid the rent and, and got us through the first uh, 30 days. And fortunately at the time we, uh, we brought our dogs down with us and our Labrador was pregnant, <laughs> um, which was a real blessing because she had these puppies and uh, we were able to eat for the next six weeks and literally not the puppies. <laughs> Yeah, no, we didn't eat the puppies. <laughs> we sold the puppies. I'm just checking. And, uh, just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Chinese. Eh? <laughs> no disrespect. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so, and uh, I had a couple of customers down here in Durban that I just spent all my time with and uh, got them on board. And uh, yeah, the business started growing. And um, I think uh, after the first five months i paid back my my mate his twenty five thousand rand with like five thousand rand interest which he didn't expect it back so soon but you know as a business owner you know your word's your word and mm. if you're going to do something do it and 
you know, it's not necessarily all about the money. What's what success is? It's it's about your integrity and uh, what you you put in. You definitely get out. And uh, you know, from from that perspective, I'm a strong believer in that. I've never been driven by money. I've always believed money to be a an end result. And uh, if you put in the graft, you'll get it. And I find these days there's a lot of um, <clears throat> youngsters. You know, when you're employing people and and you and they're looking for jobs it's all about well what are you going to offer me and you're going to go well the question is what are you going to offer me yeah you no know, yes you've got a degree yes you've got this but you you don't you don't have any experience um but you're demanding a high salary because you've only got your own needs at mind you know your own needs being yes i need to maybe pay rent i've got to pay car i've got to eat and i've got to go out joining with my mates and uh, from that perspective, you, you need to ask yourself the question, are you getting this job for the right reason? And I mean, I'll tell you a story from when I worked at DHL. Um, I was the branch supervisor and uh, I had to open up the office um, at sort of seven o'clock or, or sort of uh, six o'clock or whatever it was, let all the guys in so we could sort through all the freight. But um, I used to stay in Boxburg, worked in Santon. And um, I had a little VW Beetle, which barely made it to Samson on the best of days. <laughs> and uh, so what I would do is I'd drive through to the airport at four o'clock in the morning. I would get there. I'd help all the, the, the guys sort all the material, uh, put it in the bags. I got so good at it. The guys that have been doing it for years would ask me where, uh, where the certain areas were and where it would be routed to. <laughs> so... And then I'd get in the truck with the with the particular driver and we'd drive through to my branch and then offload it and uh, sort of open the branch and end up sort of getting home sometime seven, eight o'clock at night. And talking about what's important to you about going out on the, the you know, the parties with your friends. I mean, I don't think uh, I saw a lot of my friends at that time because they were going out and I just wanted to go home and have a bath and go to bed because <laughs> I was up at four o'clock in the morning. But I think the, the reality of that story is it's, it's a sacrifice for what sort of means. Um, you know, when I say I didn't see my friends, it wasn't that I'd sort of pushed them aside. It was just I had priorities and it was sort of what needed to be done to get the job done. And I think that's where you have to come back to what is a fair balance. I mean, then I was single. It didn't make any difference. Uh, you know, you could do whatever you, whatever you wanted um, and it didn't have an impact on other people. And I think when you start getting that balance and you find someone that you love and you want to spend time with them, you know, your, your whole priorities, uh, it shifts. Hmm. Do, what made you get out of bed at four o'clock? Because again, it's, it's a really an interesting point. And this, I had one, this whole thing at the moment for instant gratification is, is a, an area of massive concern for me. Um, and I've, I've seen it in clients where within a few months of, of, individuals getting a job they're coming to you for promotions and pay rises and you're going you've been here three months my friend it's uh, it's a little bit too soon and just a, qu a quick story as uh, my son goes to a school a local school and um i went to an assembly um and i was in the assembly and a lady stood up from her business and she was introducing the new competition and the competition was to design a pair of lady shoes so there were school kids there up to the age of 10 and um, you can feel the buzz in the assembly of they talking about these school shoes they were going to design. There was such excitement around designing a pair of shoes. And I was like, finally, someone coming in and just getting the kids to be creative for no other benefit just to do it. And then the words came out of her mouth, which just made me cry, which was, and the prize is. And it was like, oh, my gosh. And the prize was a tablet. So what happened at the end of the assembly, I overheard all the kids. And instead of the kids talking about designing the shoe and having fun, they were talking about this blooming tablet. Um, and it's just so interesting in terms of what the society we're creating at the moment, which is all around the end result rather than actually the input like you're talking about. So, so again, what, if that, when that alarm goes off at four o'clock in the morning for you to get up and stuff, what was it that made you get out of bed? Yeah, it's actually a good point, I suppose. Um, I mean, I think back then I was earning about 4,000 rand a month. And, uh, you know, I, 
well, first of all, it was a means to get to work in terms of transport. And if you speak to my mother, I hated getting up in the morning. <laughs> I really despise getting up in the morning. But, uh, you know, it takes a certain person to, to do that. And look, it's making your mark in terms of your workplace. And, uh, you know, it, it never went unnoticed. And I never asked for extra remuneration or anything like that. I think I was just hungry for learning different things. And I wanted to understand it. And I wanted to, um, uh, you know, get the respect of, of, the, of, of, of the other workers that were there, you know, saying, hey, listen, you know, I mean, most of it was in a black environment. And as a white person, you know, you're there at the ground level with them, taking the freight out of the airplane, stacking it into the bags, you know, and, and putting it in and sorting it in their different regions. And you, you're sort of making a difference in their life to make it easier. And, you know, you, the, when you get a query on the phone in the day and they kind of go, well, where's this parcel? And I could kind of go, well, actually, <laughs> it's in part time <laughs> mm. because I'd sorted it in the morning. <laughs> yeah. So the, from, from knowing exactly where everything was and, and you, you didn't even have to look in the system because I sort of knew already. But, um, you know, I, I don't know what drives you to wake up at that time in the morning. I suppose, you know, making a difference, you know, what can I achieve with, with what I'm going to do at the end of the day? I mean, I think back then it was probably I'm getting paid. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm getting a paycheck. Um, you know, well, you know, a lot of the time, you know, my parents, uh, they, they, they weren't together at the time. And um, so it was sort of tough growing up. But um, your, your whole thing about going to varsity, even if I, even if I did qualify to go to varsity, I wouldn't have gone because, you know, my parents wouldn't have been able to have afforded it. So, you know, my only real option was, well, well done, you finished my trick, you need to start working. And yeah. uh, if you want things and do things, you need to start start carrying on with it. Um, and I, I think at that age, you know, I could describe it as a bit like a sponge. You know, I was very, I was very interested in people's different ideas and, and it's quite a valuable lesson I, I learned um, you know, when you speak to people that are older, you, older than you, uh, a lot of youngsters these days have got a lot of opinions and will try and sort of try and have an argument with you or try and impress you to make it better. And a lot of the time, they just need to listen. You know? <laughs> and they don't because they have their own ideas. And, and it was quite ironic. I, I went to Joburg this week and there was a couple uh, talking behind me about some form of manufacturing. I wasn't trying to eavesdrop, but you know, in the back of my mind, I said, you guys are having this conversation, but you're not even listening to the other person. And the one person hasn't even finished saying what they're saying, and the guy's talking about something completely different, and then going, yeah, 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 I know. And I'm like, was that even productive? Because <laughs> you haven't even listened to the other person. And what, what, I, what I used to do is listen to people speak, and I wouldn't always agree with everything that they said, but it was rude, in my opinion, to tell them that. So you would take whatever you could, turn it around and sort of take the value out of it and use the value out of the conversation. And they walked away feeling like, yeah, you know, I've really you know, placed something good on that little latte or, you know, what a good kid because she's, you know, he really listened to me. You know, it was, and, and that makes a difference. And, you know, playing water polo, which I do, um, very interesting story when I, when I first started my, my business as a broker only before I owned, owned tracks was uh, I play in a water polo tournament every year. And uh, the first year I played, there was um, a lot of the older guys because they wanted to try and in introduce the younger guys to come and come into it because it was only 25 plus that could play. And I think my mate and I, we were about 22, 23 and had to try and pretend we couldn't swim. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we got to know a lot of the older guys and, and it's interesting the type of businesses they had. And um, we went to, to, it was in George in the Quays and the one evening all the guys were there and I paid for the whole bill. And, uh, hey, wow, it upset some people because they're like, who's this kid paying for the bill and what's going on here? And uh, they kept on putting money in my top pocket. I think I ended up getting more money back for the whole bill than, uh, <laughs> than I did at the end because everyone thought, no, they needed to pay their way. But, you know, the value that gave was one of the guys was the big MD of Fast and uh, Fresh at the time. 
And one of the main vehicles that we wanted to use was closed Pantex um, from Durban to Joburg. And back then it was really difficult getting these type of vehicles. Um, so here I was, new business, maybe doing 60 grand a month at the most, and no credits, history, nothing. And uh, I open an account with these guys, he sends me the form and they come back and go, but you don't have any references. And this guy just said, don't worry about his references, he's good. And uh, I ended up spending like sort of 200 to 300,000 rand a month. No one in the organization could understand how I'd got this right. <laughs> but uh, even even the guys we dealt with with getting trucks, he says, I, I don't know who you are, but he says, I've been told they've got to give you trucks over and above some of their corporate clients like Woolworths. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was quite uncanny. And, and that's sort of a, a little lesson to be learned in terms of, you know, what, what you sow today, you'll reap later. As a, you know, and, and my intention was never to sort of impress him. And I mean, I didn't really know who he was. We, we chat, we'd, we'd have a few beers together. And, you, you know, it, I'd, I'd never know, knew at the time who he was or sort of what he worked for. And that's never been my intention. You know, it's always good to know what people do, but, you know, you don't want to come across as, hey, what do you do? What do you do? Mm. <laughs> and then, no, I don't want to talk to you because that doesn't help me and move on. You know, you have to be, you have to be flexible and, and, you know, give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And there's going to be people you don't like, but it's how you show it and how you want to, you know, drive it forward. That's such a great lesson. That's such a great story around how many of us actually go into an environment or a situation looking for an instant return. I want to speak to this person because I want to get something rather than just going in and saying, how can I benefit you? Or I just want to be a good person. That's all I want to do. I just want to buy you a drink. I don't want to do anything else. I'm not looking for anything. I just want to buy, buy you a drink. And it's a, it's a great lesson for, um, for our listeners just to, to not always think about the returns that you're expecting. Just go out there and and open yourself up and be present Um, and be present in the moment and, and not actually think about the future benefits. I think it's a, it's a great story, a great lesson for everyone to remember. Yeah. I'm really, uh, there's a number of things there. There's a couple of things which we'll go, we'll start, we'll talk about obviously your, your other business, um, which we'll talk about, which I think is really around the making a difference in the sporting with your, your sporting business. And we'll, we'll carry on talking about TMC, which is um, your trucking business. Um, but I, one thing you, you talked about was just the move from Joburg to Durban and starting a business with 300 rand in your pocket and not eating puppies, but uh, making uh, surviving off puppies. Um, Cause a lot of, a lot of questions we get from our members and from listeners is around decision-making. How, how do you go about your understanding risk? How do you go about making these kind of massive decisions? So uh, I'm just wondering if you could share with us your, your journey in terms of the thought process that you and, and Michelle went through to move from, to take such a big risk? Yeah, I think um, it's quite a difficult question to answer, actually, because, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's all about your individual drive. And, um, you, you know, what was your question regarding your listeners? What did you say again about... Um, so they, they ask a lot of questions around decisions. How, how do I know um, what's the right decision? What kind of risk levels? And, and obviously your, your journey from... I think, I, think, I think the first thing to that is you need to have confidence in yourself. Um, you know, obviously within reason. Um, I'm a JP boy. So, you know, they always say at school, you know, how does a JP boy count? It's 10 Jack, Queen, King. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, yes, so in life there is a bit of a gamble, high risk, high reward. Um, but I think, you know, in saying that, you've got to have your ear to the ground. You've got to really know what's going on. And I mean, if you're confident in your product and you know it and you believe in yourself and you know what you can do, um, you know, the world's your oyster. Um, I think it's when you have that negativity. And, you know, even now, uh, you know, people go, oh, it's so hard. That's up 15%. Yes, the diesel's going up. And yes, they're all issues. But how do we overcome them? And how do we become positive out of it? And you know, I went through a stage in my life where I didn't like to associate with complaining people and negative people. I, want to, I wanted to associate myself with positiveness. And the more positiveness you surround yourself in, the greater you can become. 
And the more you can absorb in terms of knowledge, the more you can make a, a valid decision and hear what's going on around you. And I mean, I, I say that with a bit of respect that, you know, not to be uh, blindsided by, you know, ooh, ooh, I'm so positive uh, and uh, be unsurreal about it. Um, you know, there is a level, but mm. it's just having that information to make that, that particular decision. And, you know, sometimes you have to jump into the fire to get ahead of the game. Um, you know, sometimes you've got to take those risks and go, yes. And I mean, I've done that. I mean, uh, I had a restaurant and <laughs> got burns, you know, lost a million rand. It's an interesting varsity lesson. Mm. Um, you know, I've taken uh, too much of someone's word in terms of the transport game and lost two million rand. Um, you know, it, it's, it shows that confidence now I can talk about it, but um, I should have gone to a lot of meetings. But so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just sort of different angles. It's, it's how you look at it and how you approach it. So, yes, you, you learn. You learn in terms of valuable lessons as to how far do you go. And, and you know, maybe that's something you guys should talk about is, uh, you know, high-risk customers. You know, when do you cut it off? And, and for me, that's, it's, it's such a difficult thing because – um, my wife says to me all the time, says, you're too nice. You, you, you know, you give them too much leeway and she's hundred percent right. Mm. But, uh, and, and the reason that is, is because I've been there. I've been down where you can't afford to pay a supplier and your intentions are good, but you know, you still want to be able to trade. And, uh, from their perspective, you, you've got to understand is when do you draw the line? And I must be honest, the more now I'm getting older, I'm getting a bit more ruthless and I, you know, I'm sort of getting, you know, you taking advantage of my goodwill, and yeah. uh, and and that's where you have to try and try and tune that in, because these days you open up an account for somebody, you credit vet them, you phone their suppliers, they all say it's a great account, it's all good, and then now you um, you do work for them, you, they're going to pay you thirty days, so they owe you twenty five grand in in current, you do another twenty five thousand rand for them, now it's time for them to pay. They come with a story that maybe your paperwork wasn't correct or this isn't right or maybe you missed their cutoff. By the third month, they owe you 70,000 Rand. And now they, so now you go, whoa, there's a problem. You stop doing work for them. But your intentions were good for the first sort of 60 days because they've got an account. And you've done everything you should have done. You've done all the correct checks. You've done all the, 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 the vettings. You phoned them. But now you want to get the money out of them. And then it becomes... I'm begging you for the money. Yeah. And you kind of get to a situation where, you know, how does this work? <laughs> I've done the work and, and you want to have a go at me because you haven't paid me. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, a, it is a difficult one, like you said, in terms of, you know, how do you make those decisions? And, and I mean, you, you get a feel for it. Eh? I think experience leads you down that road and you get a feel for it. And, I mean, definitely tuning in to, to, to what you guys currently have and, you know, absorbing that information from all the various people you speak to can only be valuable. And, uh, you know, my suggestion is you, you need to keep your ear to the ground and listen to what people have to say so you can make an informed decision and you can make the right one. Yeah, it reiterates what you were saying earlier as well around um, sort of startups, younger entrepreneurs a lot of them thinking that they have all the answers and are not as clear in terms of the types of questions they need to ask from, from those people who have failed and survived and succeeded to actually learn the lessons, lessons that they've learned and try and avoid those mistakes as much as possible. Yeah, I just want to say, just sorry to interrupt you there. I mean, uh, just something that you had on your webinar the other night regarding, uh, I'm not sure what the lady's name was, you know, about trying to manage her, um, her offline and, uh, you know, her web designer and all the rest of it. And I mean, you were spot on by sort of saying, you know, this person does that, this person does this. And, you know, you can't expect one person to do everything. Um, you need to specialize and have the correct people doing what they need to do. And having timelines and deadlines put in place is, is, is key. So, you know, you can't be everything to everybody and, and, I think that's quite an important, important lesson to be learned, um, especially from that, because that, that, that webinar you did on the RT thing, I, I was quite intrigued on how you guys were going to get around answering that because <laughs> it's, it's very sensitive. It's very sensitive because, 
you know, in my my past experience, <laughs> those guys are quite far out there, and you know, you know, it's it's the whole thing about you go to the restaurant you know good food doesn't come in 10 minutes yeah, yeah. <laughs> how long do you want to wait what are you here for you know but also at the end of the day you've got a business to run and uh, you, you you paying for a service and if something that I've learned and this is where a lot of people get uh, distracted in terms of lawyers and uh, and so forth and probably people will hate me for saying it us is that you pay a lawyer to do your bidding He's not paying you to tell you what to do. You're mm -hmm. paying him for advice. Yeah. Whether you like that advice, you have every right to question it. Just because he says it, it doesn't mean it's right. And, and if, if any advice I can give, it's saying, who knows your business better, him or you? It's a yeah. simple question, isn't it? So you know your business better and you know what, what you want out of whatever thing you may be fighting for. And a lot of the times he'll be like, no, but that's, but he doesn't get it. And, and my whole thing is I'm employing you to do what I want you to do. If I'm wrong, that's my problem. Mm. You know, if we don't win, then I'll take that on myself, but I need you to take what I'm telling you and transfer it into that lawyer lingo yep. and don't stand up there and go, your honor and all those nice, pretty things because I'm not qualified to do that, mm. you know, and uh, sort of get some balls and be a bit stronger about it because you don't want to fight. Let's fight. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a really good one about expertise and it's, um, and it's the challenge that especially um, startups and, and entrepreneurs have is, is maybe they, they start off as a technician. So they've got a skill set. Let's just use air conditioning as an example where they start off as really, really good at installing, servicing tech, uh, air conditioning units but then obviously see a business opportunity and try and branch into that business owner. But their, their expertise still lies in, in the technician spot. It's a, it's, a, it's a real challenge that a lot of people have is that transition between technician to business owner and understanding that other people are actually better than them at certain things. And it's, then that's okay. Yeah. Um, I've got just a very interesting question as well, just because again, I know our listeners will be thinking about it. Um, debtors. Obviously, you, you talked about the, the accounts and the challenges of um, debtors and, and managing debtors. Are there one or two top tips that you could give around how to manage uh, debtors and collect? Because obviously, business is all about cash flow. Baseball bet. <laughs> <laughs> Number one tip from Phil Lewis. You know, look, <laughs> and a really big fellow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which you can hide behind. <laughs> No, look, at the end of the day, you know, the only way you can manage it is to keep on it. And, you know, you've probably heard it a thousand times. He who shouts the loudest gets answered. Mm. And uh, being that nice guy and just going, oh, no, it'll be okay. It's not the right way. You have to continuously phone them and be polite. I don't believe shouting and screaming at someone's going to get you, get you your money any quicker. But you want to get the right answers. You know, it's sort of like, do you have it? No, I don't. When will you have it? Okay. When can I have mine? You know, so, and not being, you know, oh, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that because it happens. A lot of the guys get quite emotional and I can understand why, because you've got certain things you need to pay. And I mean, in terms of running a successful business, you need to have a buffer, you know, uh, that big customer that you rely on all the time. Don't, don't become, don't become complacent. And one of the things when I started doing my business, I did a lot of work for some big corporates and I said, I'm blessed. I've got this work but I'm going to work around it. I'm not just going to sit back and true as Bob, you know, three, four years, I don't do as much work for them anymore. And they were my bread and butter. Now I've got six or seven customers like that, that are now my bread and butter because when it was good, I decided to work hard and, and make it that I'm not just reliant on that one customer. And I think a lot of business owners make that mistake. You know, they become too complacent. They become too comfortable on the work they have and don't think it'll ever go away. And I, I think uh, you, you, if, if that's the way you're thinking, it's, it's, it's not a good plan. It's a slippery of slope, isn't forward. it? Yeah, there's <clears throat> two, two great pieces of advice that, that you've just shared there. One is around how do you manage risk in your business that if you're having one customer, one client who's contributing 70%, anywhere 70% and above of your total revenue, then you've got to be really, really worried because... You lose that customer, you lose your business. Um, 
So that's one thing. It's a great lesson that you've just shared, Phil. The second thing that I love, which I think, and I know most businesses who aren't successful do the complete opposite to you, which is, uh, for me, the greatest, if you're going to take one thing, ladies and gentlemen, out of this podcast of what Phil's, Phil said, this is the thing that Phil said that you should take out. When times are good, work harder. Um, it's a critical lesson to learn that when you do have the cash coming, when you have that clients, that's when you've got you've to ramp it up again. And you'll see the difference. The successful business owners work twice as hard when times are good to ensure they maintain momentum unsuccessful businesses slack off because they've got it easy it's a phenomenal lesson phil so thanks for sharing that one and it's and you know what it's a lot easier when when all your financials are in order and you're not worrying about your your finances you can go out and sell it and you know people people can see when you're under pressure yeah in terms of salesmen You, you can talk to sales guys that are successful and you can talk to ones that aren't that are struggling and you just go into a little bit of their background and you'll find out exactly why they're not selling because they, they worried about their next car payments and all the rest of it. And they, when they go to the customer, it's like they in the back of their mind, they go, if I don't sign this, I'm either going to be fired or I'm not going to make that com and I, I can't get that holiday for the girlfriend or whatever the case is. And his intentions for that sale aren't good. So he's not selling from the heart. And, uh, you know, and I, I think that's why, you know, we successful in terms of the way we build our relationships and, you know, I believe in family and stuff. So I have a suite at the, at the stadium and we invite customers with their families and it makes the world a difference. You know, they go, oh, when are we going to the TMC box again? You know, because <laughs> they want to meet my kids and look, I'm fortunate in that regard. But I think even if I didn't have kids, I'd still let them come with their families. Because the last thing you want to do is like, well, where's daddy on the weekend? Yeah. Oh, no, exactly. hold on a second. We're all going to the rugby together. Oh, that's exciting. So I'd rather have less customers and more with their families and it's, they're enjoying it, you know. And, and that's something that, that people also forget. Um, a lot of strong businessmen that are successful, um, they don't have families, they don't have kids, they miss that point sometimes. So when they, uh, you know, talking to other people and the guy's got commitments. You can say, oh, geez, you know, where's your, where's your, where's your commitment? Um, you know, or an employee that's got a family. It's like, well, you know, I don't, you can't do that. You can't mm-hmm. compare yourself to somebody else in terms of employees and, and what his personal uh, aspirations and goals are. And as any business owner, get to sort of know and understand your employees, depending, obviously, if you're massive, it, it doesn't work all the time, but at least your top management that you're relying on a daily basis. If you know that little bit of extra about them, you know where he is at the time and you're going to get the most out of those individuals, you know, just because you're showing that you care and, you know, and it's hard being the boss sometimes because you have to say no sometimes and they don't understand why, but you know, that's coming back to when do you make those hard decisions, et cetera, you know, and it all comes with time and experience, but, those are the people on the ground. They're the ones that you need to care about and give them the time of day and, you know, they'll perform for you, um, you know, through and through. It's a very valuable lesson. Yeah, it's cool. Again, it, uh, you have this thing where, uh, it's, it's, it's industry dependent and stuff where there's that sense of you've got to be a not nice person to get to the top. Um, I disagree with that. I so do I. I, say, so you know, I mean, you could be Ivan the Terrible or Hitler. Mm. Or, you know, where did that get them at the end of the day? Yeah. Uh, you understand you're not there for votes and uh, you're not there to be uh, loved by everybody. But I do believe you can be fair. Mm. You know, uh, you don't always have to be right because you, we're all human. But as uh, my, my belief but is... I bet Michelle doesn't say that. As She's always fair. <laughs> And, 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 you know, if I approach anything and it's always the, the same thing is to say, well, if I was in those shoes, how would I like to be treated? And would I, would, would I want to be spoken to like that? And at that tipping point, when I've gotten angry, it's like, well, you needed to be spoken to like that because we've had lots of chats and you don't listen. So maybe let me try a different approach now. Mm. And uh, I, it's the same old thing, you know, how, if it was me, how would I like to be dealt with? And uh, I think that's, that's the most important thing, you know, and, you know, as an owner, you can turn around and you can say, 
oh, you know, my employee didn't do this, he didn't do that, but they still expect to get paid at the end of the month. <laughs> you know, if I didn't pay them at the end of the month, can you imagine how they'd get upset? Yeah. But they can get to do my stuff, but it's okay. You know, so yes, we, we, we do forgive and, uh, you know, we roll with those punches as business owners and we take that risk. Um, you know, I think a lot of people can moan about their bosses and complain about their work and all the rest of it, but they actually don't look at the positive and think, well, you know, how gifted am I? How blessed am I that I've actually got this job? You know, let me actually just put a bit of effort in and you'll find they'll end up getting an increase and just to change their perception. You know, you, it's pointless, you know, banging your head against the wall continuously and going, ow, ow, ow. <laughs> <stop it. laughs> yeah. you know, change is, is, is very important. And, you know, I think we need to be real in this world. You're always going to get the person that needs to work for a boss and for an environment. Not everybody's uh, their own entrepreneur in terms of being successful. Mm. And it does take a different kind of person to do that. But we also have to understand that in the food chain, if you want to compare it, you need those other people. And those people are happy doing what they're doing. Don't criticize them for it. You know, a lot of the times you'll get a guy saying, oh, you can be so much more and you can do this. He doesn't want to. Yeah. And as soon as you realize that as an owner, you'll utilize him in the best possible way and he'll give you 150%. And, you know, I think people forget there's the, the people element as to how we manage different people. You can't manage everybody the same. It, it just doesn't work. Everyone likes different things. And, uh, you know, it's, I could for argument's sake say, hey, Mark, listen, I want you to go out and sell this product. If you do that, I'll give you 10,000 rand. You'll go, yeah, that's cool. But now, maybe you're not money driven. I'll go, okay, Mark, listen, you know, you do a lot of bike riding. If you go out and do all those sales, I'm going to buy you the latest mountain bike. Hmm. You're going to be, whoa. Meanwhile, the mountain bike's only six grand. You could have bought it with the money anyway, but you, that doesn't drive you. Yeah. But you wouldn't go and spend that money on the bike because of your circumstances. So you understand all the different angles of how people are different and, and what drives different people and, and what is the best packages to put together for them. Um, and I think if, if we could get that right, I think we'd all be very, very successful um, accordingly. Yeah, and again, it's um, cheapest. Your, um, your, your lessons are flying. And um, I love this lesson as well that you've just shared. And it's, it's, it's the one-size-fits-all mentality that too many businesses have. It's, and again, who do they do it for? They do it. The one-size-fits-all only benefits one person. That's the business owner because it makes their life easy. That they do. Yeah, exactly. So I'll do one reward <laughs> program. But what you're saying is, and we did a, a previous podcast, which I'd, I'd really suggest listeners listen to with Robin Seeger, who is a real performance guru. And in that, he talked about we're motivated by real three big things. We want to be appreciated. We want to be understood and we want to be heard. Um, and it's really critical for business owners to understand those, those motivators. And especially when, when businesses aren't uh, hundreds of employees big, you can be flexible. You can structure your reward and recognition packages around the individual. What do they want in order to, to be motivated and successful, not rather than what am I going to give you? But so, so it's a great lesson for business owners as well is, is be flexible with your employees uh, and really listen to what they want and don't be scared to, um, to adapt your stuff to align to what they need because without them, you are in a bit of trouble. Um, you obviously TMC is a phenomenally successful business. Um, and through that, that success, uh, and obviously that success has been built up. Like you talked about is a lot of relationships having, having really worked hard to build good relationship with your clients, deliver a phenomenal service. And like you started off this conversation talking about, about your, your normal day, your, you straight away talked about customers. That's the first thing you talked about. So TMC is very much built around that. Um, TMC and the success of TMC has allowed you to, to go into a slightly a different angle with a new business. Um, and one thing you talked about a lot has been making a difference. So do you want to, I love this other business, yeah. obviously it, it touches my heart yeah. as well. Um, and it's around the, the making a difference. Do you want to give a, a little bit of an overview around, around the business and, and where, where this idea came from? Um, and yeah, just give us a little bit of an overview because I love the transition because it has nothing to do with TMC, really. 
So, so transport and tracking is pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ah, uh, look, when I say pretty boring, you know what? It, it 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 has its ups and downs, but it does have its excitements and all the rest of it. But um, you know, I spoke earlier about having opportunities for the kids and uh, and and the family and stuff. And you know, I thought. Do my kids maybe want to do transport when they're older? You know, let me try and create opportunities. Because, I mean, in today's time and age, it's very difficult to sort of get those opportunities. And I thought the more I can create for them, the better it is. <clears throat> now, with owning a, a, a really nice business is you get a lot of people coming and asking for assistance. And, you know, being the kind of person I am, I, I like to be giving and open and, and try and help out whoever I can because, I realized, you know, once upon a time I was there and, um, you know, and it's not really a handout or, or whatever, but, you know, you, you inspiring the youth of today and by doing something like that, you might, you teaching them very valuable lessons by giving them an advert in their book or, you know, helping at the schools or whatever the case is. So, um, you know, for me as a, as a transport business, you know, doing those sort of things has no benefit for, for us as a business. And, uh, you, you know, it's not like uh, we don't really want to move people's furniture around. That's not really what our game is. But that's sort of the only angle you'll get out of that. So, you know, we thought about, well, how can we turn this around? What is fun? What is exciting? And what are people doing? So I think finding that business is that niche and, uh, and understanding where we can fit in. Because it doesn't matter what industry you do, there's enough for everybody. There's enough business for everybody you know, when somebody says, oh, it's not working, you haven't worked hard enough at it to make it work. And, you know, oh, so-and-so's got all the customers. I promise you, there's a lot of customers. And you can always tailor make something for each individual customer and have enough when you're ready to say it's enough. So realistically, we started a, a travel agency. Um, it's called Adventure Sports Exchange. It's got all the similar colors to TMC, so you can see that they are affiliated. But um, yeah, it's a bit more on a reciprocal level. Um, so to give you an idea, we put together school packages, overseas trips, organized fixtures. And that's basically what we want to specialize in. We do a lot of uh, stuff for, um, you know, corporates. If they want to do incentive trips, they want to go to the Grand Prix or even boys packages or ladies packages to go and do something different, shopping in Dubai or whatever, you know. Um, but we majorly involved in the schools and, and hence why I wanted to, you know, let them give me their work and I want to be able to give back to them. So if they've got a student that can't afford it, I want to try and take a portion of those proceeds and put it back into the community and back into the schools. And I mean, at the moment, we, we currently do uh, varsity college. So we sponsor their hockey side and uh, we give them, uh, I bought a 22 seater bus which basically transport, transports all their players from uh, Peter Maritzburg to Durban North. They've got facilities at the gym at Northwood, which is for 20 players doing conditioning. And uh, yeah, so that's a little bit of giving back. Um, we sponsor the JP side in Joburg. We sponsor Kipps Primary in, uh, in Johannesburg as well. Um, so there's a lot of things that we, we're getting involved with by giving them kits and, and so forth. And, you know, it's not about, well, what business you give me, what you get. It's like, well, you support me and I'll support you. And, and fortunately with the trucking business, it gives me that, that opportunity to, to do stuff different that other travel agents can't do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's that through that support, we can help and, and do communities at, at really good value pricing. So, but it's exciting because we get to travel, um, you know, and uh, you can meet some really interesting people around that and can be fun. I mean, my son's 18. He's very keen to get involved in terms of going back to Amsterdam. <laughs> 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 so, yes, yeah, so it, it just opens doors and gives opportunities. Um, you know, we, we, we've done... I mean, we, we, we support the Southern Cow Ten side. So it's all over the country. It's not just sort of limited to to Durban as per se. And uh, yeah, and, and we're looking for the schools to support us so that we can support them. And, you know, my whole philosophy is, you know, you're going to spend the money anyway. You know, why don't you spend it with someone who you like? Or 
spend spend the money with somebody who's going to support you, mm. you know, as opposed to, and I, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I mean, no disrespect to any other travel agencies, but you know, at the end of the day, they've got targets. They're going to do things a certain way. You're going to book with them. You're never going to hear from them again. Um, you know, they're not going to go, Ooh, oh, by the way, listen, we really want to get involved in this project and uh, please support us going forward. You know, it doesn't happen. So it's just an avenue to be able to get involved in the community and sell something that's sellable that people like, you know, uh, traveling's to everybody, um, you know, to the person that's going to Cape Town, to the person that's traveling overseas. Everybody loves travel. I mean, I don't think there's many people that don't say, uh, no, I'd hate to go on an overseas trip. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd, I'd really, I'd really dislike it if I, if, if I had to go to the Kruger this weekend, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it, it's, 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 it, it pushes everyone's buttons. And, and, you know, when you're working in an environment, you, you have to have Lee, you've got to do something. Um, yeah. You know? So yes, it, it, it turns everybody's buttons on. Uh, well, that's what I, I would hope. Yeah. And again, it's a great, great philosophy and it's a great lesson for, for people who are thinking of launching a business is so identifying a need of um, a target market. So the schools go on trips, they travel. So there's a need straight away. And then understanding what is your differentiator and your, the great ways how you approach this business was, was not around how am I going to make uh, a very, very successful business. That, that's an outcome that will take care of itself. Is how am I going to create a win-win situation? How am I going to ensure that they get the best service, but also I'm able to provide something for them that's different? I can, I can look at supporting individuals who can't afford potentially to do it, but there's a way that we can make everybody win. And it's a great way to look at a business rather than going, how am I going to make sure this business generates a million rand as quick as it possibly can? I think too many startup or young entrepreneurs are purely looking about they're looking at the end product they're looking at the money that they can make rather than looking at how am i creating a win-win that makes my proposition different from everyone else's and i think one thing i learned about uh, my restaurants <laughs> that didn't work out so well was stick to your knitting and a lot of guys will say that stick to your knitting and then they go well how, how's travel sticking to your knitting <laughs> <laughs> So I said, well, you, you know, it comes with a couple of, I think it's a good business to invest in because of coming from that environment. And the nice thing is it's not like a restaurant that's, or a, you know, or a pet shop that feeds every day. You know, it's not, uh, it's not an ongoing sort of needs rent. It needs this. So it, it has quite a lot of uh, synergies with my, my current business. You know, it shares a lot of, a lot of the expenses, which, which makes a difference. So we, we can have like a lot of fun with it at least, you know? Yeah. And there's another great lesson that, um, so what you did is you looked at your business and you said, right, how's my business structured? What are the foundations and the expertise that I've already invested in? What's the infrastructure look like my business? And then you've gone, well, what am I engaging with on a regular basis with your daughters and your son and, and what are their needs? And then how can I fulfill their needs? with the existing infrastructure that I already have with them TMC. So you can almost double your profit from the same cost base. And it's just another great lesson that business owners forget is, do you actually understand the infrastructure you have in place? Yeah, synergies. I mean, so most of my customers that uh, use me for my transport, they travel. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, they, they go all over the place. So, you know, there's another whole market without even concentrating on school tours. There's another whole dynamic of corporate clients, which you've got your fingers on, you know, it's diversifying a business and making the best out of it that both can benefit without hurting the other one, which is, which is also very, very key about, uh, you know, what you think about, you know, you don't want to come up with a good idea because of a particular customer, you screw that up and then you end up losing what was actually sort of your bread and butter. Yeah. You know, and it, that then again comes back to those decisions you make and, how you work it, right? Yeah, and again, it's a great one about the more you understand your customer and what the customer is looking for in all aspects of their life. And then, so again, you sort of painting a picture here of you have a core product, which is TMC, that's allowed you to, to really grow a very successful business and build phenomenal relationships with your, with your clients. 
you've then had that ability to pause and reflect and not only look at your business in terms of the infrastructure that you have, but also what are the needs and wants of your client base? And then how can you fulfill those needs by leveraging on, like you said, the synergies that I have in the business? And it's just a, again, it's a great model that you've just shared with all our listeners about how to expand multiple revenue streams off the same cost base. And it all comes down to one word, which you've, you've talked about time and time again is, is relationships. And it's a, it's a phenomenal lesson for, uh, for listeners to, to be thinking about. You should do uh, just off the top uh, off the topic a bit, you know, because I know you've, you're very focused on business owners and that. You, you should try and sort of get a, a feel for what employees want from their from their owners, mm. you know, because no one really thinks about that um, too much. It's sort of like, well, how does how does my boss piss me off? <laughs> yeah, that'd be a great one to do. <laughs> you know, from a reverse side of things. I will definitely remember that one. Um, so we're getting, we're getting close to the end of, of our chat and um, I've got one more question I want to ask. And then at the end of every one of our, our podcasts, we ask one or two standard questions, which um, sometimes draw silence and blanks and stuff, but you're not allowed to get away with it. So um, before we, we sort of wrap up, we, we start off by talking about what's the, the day, day in the life of the moment of, of Phil Lewis. If we fast forward 10 years today, um, how do you imagine your a day in the life of Phil Lewis ten years from today would look like? So being driven and successful, you know, one of my biggest things are is about having a short term and long term goal. So, you know, a question like that doesn't really fear me, or well, doesn't scare me because you know I know what the end goal is at the end of the day. You know, so I mean, for me as a transport business, I think like anybody, I want to build it up so that somebody notices that little little dot on the on the Richter scale amongst all the big players and uh, says, right, he's, he's becoming challenging. Let's buy him. Yep. And uh, obviously when that happens, I want to have fun with my travel agency, you know? So, and, you know, just give the kids the life that they want to have within reason, you know, uh, it's, you know, there's a difference between spoiling them, but uh, yeah, I think the end term goal is to sort of, Work really hard at this, find a decent buy for it, and um, yeah, keep the travel agency and uh, have fun. That's um, it's a great way to look at it. Just um, and again, what you've articulated, which business owners need to think about, is is having clarity around your exit strategy, um, and you've obviously got great clarity. Um, so building on from that, a couple of questions that we ask a lot of our our guests. So. Um, we get to a stage in the world where everything's wiped. So there's no record of what you've achieved in your life. It's all gone. All you've left with is a pen and paper. And on the pen and paper, you're allowed to write three truths that you'd like to share. So three things, three pieces of advice that you'd like to share with your kids. Uh, what would those um, three pieces of advice be that you would, you would share with your kids? I think uh, always to be true to yourself. I think that's uh, a very important one. Um, have have respect for um, all around you and what happens around you because if you respect everything else, it'll always uh, you know have the same respect back for yourself. Um, and number three, be famous and leave a legacy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, and that leads me to my last question for you. So obviously you're a lo- you're a long way off from this, but. Um, your legacy. So let's, what would you like people to be talking about you in 50 years time? What, how would they like, how would you like them to describe Phil Lewis in 50 years time? So, you know, it's always an interesting question. Everyone kind of says, well, I want to build the legacy. And I think for me, the most important thing is, is what my kids think of me. You know, like I really couldn't care much for what everyone else thinks. Mm. Because if I thought about what it, all they thought, I wouldn't move forward in terms of things I need to do. Um, if you live your life on what everybody else thinks, it's, it's, not, it's not productive, it's not successful. So, you know, as a legacy, do I want to be rich and famous? No. You know, do I want a life of a rock star? No. You know, I want to be full Lewis. And I think the question you should be asking is sort of like, when you die, how many people would be at your funeral and what would they say about you? Um, you know, kind, loving always willing to give, um, you know, 
sort of always willing to help and assist where he could, um, you know. And I think I think as long as you can kind of live your life saying, you know, I've done my best in terms of what I could. Um, you know, I, I, I sleep at night, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Rob anybody and, you know, where some people, hey, man, I don't know how yeah. the doctors sleep. After. <laughs> If I had that much money, I suppose you could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think honesty is the best thing. I mean, just to, before we end off, I, I've got two rules in my business and uh, it's, it's simply don't lie to me and don't steal from me. Mm. If anything else we can sort of work out. Um, you know, if you're going to try and uh, lie around what happened in an incident or whatever, you're going to have a problem. And I've, and I'm quite ruthless when it comes to that. You know, lie to me, I'll just tell you, pack your bags, go. And if I see you at the CCMA, I see you at the CCMA because we're not going to work well together. And, yeah. and, and that all boils down to integrity and, uh, and being, being truthful. Brilliant. Um, just before I wrap up, for, for those listeners who have been inspired and want to work with you, they, they're, they're really intrigued more about your, your adventure businesses and, and your, your trucking business. How, how do people get in touch with Phil Lewis? What's the best way for them to stay in touch with you and get in touch with you? So we, obviously, you can follow us on Facebook. Um, I'm not a massive social media fundy and all the rest of it, but they say you've got to do it. It can help grow your business. I think it depends on what sort of business you're in. As uh, you know, people will complain socially just to get something for free. <laughs> goodness, I'm not in that sort of game, but the, the travel agency might be a bit vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we've got websites, so it's uh, www.tmclogistics.co.za. And then obviously on the travel side, it's Adventure Sports Exchange, which is www.adsport.co.za. You can book flights on there if you want. Uh, it's got its own sort of travel start uh, um, set up where you can put it in and uh, it'll, it'll compare all the flights for you and, and you can book accordingly and so forth. But um, yeah, otherwise, uh, any social media, if you put me up, I'm sure my number will come up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you've got any transport needs or you want us to help you save some money, I'm, I'm quite happy to come and come and consult and i've said that to a lot of my friends i said guys i might not do your transport but you know what i've been doing this for 20 odd years use my experience uh, i've been through the channels um even if i don't do the work and i can help you save some money with your current supplier uh, um you know it always leads to something else down the road and that's a it's a great way to to finish up and i'd like to just um thank you twofold i'd like to thank you very much for for giving up your time to share your, your lessons, your, the failings and the many, many successes that you've had and the real practical tips for current and future individuals, both within business employees, in order to build um, the journey and, and go on the journey they want to. Thank you very much for giving up your time and sharing your insight. And the, the second thing I'd like to thank you for is, is your pure desire and yeah, your pureness, your pureness around making a difference, your pureness around really wanting to help people. You, you, you're not doing it for the money. You're not doing it for the fame. You're not doing it for the glory. You're purely doing it because you want people to be happy and you want people to be successful. And it is today's society, those kind of people are, you don't come across them very often. So thank you for, for what you do in and around the communities for from reminding people that actually being a good human being first and foremost is, is the priority um, and, and trusting that the right things will come out of it. So many thanks for your time. Many thanks for being a phenomenal human being and, and contributing so much to society. And uh, thank you to you, Mark, and uh, the Revolutionary Club for giving me this opportunity to really come and share a bit. Um, you know, if uh, there's any questions and you want to email them through to me from any of your subscribers, I'd be happy to sort of uh, have a look and see where I can help out or whatever the case is uh, in terms of sorting out some of their issues, uh, if need be, um, you know, free of charge. That's fine. <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll put Phil's, um, we'll create a little email address for Phil and we'll put uh, an email address for Phil at the bottom of the description uh, and then you, can, then you can have a look and send them through. Um, so this podcast has been brought to you by the Business Revolutionary Club. Um, we provide free business coaching every 14 days. 
So uh, please subscribe to the Business Revolution Club. If you've enjoyed this podcast, if you've got lessons out of this, practical tips, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and leave comments, leave reviews. Um, challenge Phil of what he said. Identify the things that Phil's talked about that really resonates with you. Uh, and if there's any other topics you'd like to chat about, please don't be fe uh, fearful of sharing those with us. So thank you for joining the Business Revolution podcast and we look forward to sharing more revolutionaries with you in the near future.